A strong man weakened by a virus. Protesters call for the impeachment of Brazil's president over the COVID-19 crisis. Will he survive? And what does it mean for populism in the region? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Sami Zaydan. He's been a staunch coronavirus sceptic. But now Brazil's president is in the hot seat for his handling of the pandemic. Thousands of people have taken to the streets, demanding he be impeached over the nation's health crisis. Well, recent polls show his approval ratings have declined. Many people are calling on him to leave office. Bolsonaro has been blamed for a lack of government planning and a delay in rolling out vaccines. Brazil is among the worst hit countries with the second largest number of COVID-19 deaths. They stand at more than 215,000. Infections are surging, hospitals are overstretched and oxygen supplies are running low. I feel as if Brazil doesn't have a government. Brazil has been left to fend for itself. We have psychopaths in power and the time has come. No one can take it anymore. We're not going to wait for a million of our people to die for people to rise up. Nobody can take it anymore. There's all this horrible fake news that is deceiving people and the president's disapproval rating is greater than his approval. Gather strength, we have to get rid of that guy or else Brazil will go under. He will bring an end to the economy, so impeachment now and out with Bolsonaro. The populist and conservative president took office in 2019 after defeating leftists who'd ruled for decades. His victory was seen as part of growing support for far-right movements in many countries. He's been criticised for favouring torture and praising the nation's former dictatorship. His comments on race, gender and sexual orientation have also provoked controversy. The president has labelled coronavirus a little flu pushed for quarantine measures to be lifted and sent contradictory messages about masks and social distancing. And he's been sued by indigenous leaders at the International Criminal Court over damage caused by his environmental policies. Let's bring our guest into the show now. We have joining us uh, from London, Carlos Caicedo. He's a senior principal analyst focusing on Brazil at IHS market. In Sao Paulo, we have Gabriela Lotta. She's a professor of public administration at the Getúlio Vargas Foundation. And in London, we have Francisco Dominguez. He's the head of a research group on Latin America at Middlesex University. Welcome to you all. If I could start with Gabriela in Sao Paulo. Gabriela, how much of a threat are the current protests in the street? Hi, everybody. It's uh, an honor to be here with you. So um, we started having the protest finally after uh, a long period of uh, decrease of the approval of the, the, of the president. But at now, we don't really know what's going on because uh, all the situation in Brazil is unclear. Of course, now we are discussing impeachment. We have this protest, but we don't have any kind of agreement about the next day. And in order to have an impeachment, we have to have an agreement. Uh, so to give you an example, we had two protests, one on Saturday and one on, the, on Sunday. The Saturday one was about the, the people on the left side and the Sunday one was from the people of the right side. So the, the society is very divided, but everybody is uh, somehow blaming the president now about the crisis, the economic and the pandemic crisis we are living at this moment. Interesting. Francisco, how significant is it, though, although it's not very clear if there's a consensus, how significant is it that parts of the right wing have joined the protests, even if it's on a different day, of course? Yeah, I think it's very significant. I mean, Bolsonaro has been weakened for a while now. I uh, remember he started with 55% now, which is, is much lower. And on top of that, he had a majority, certainly was a majority party in terms of seats in the Congress, 56. 
this part is split and now is in the region of 22-23. Uh, and he has, he's facing 400 requests, sorry, 47 requests of impeachment from various organizations, various political parties. And the accusations range from misdemeanor to gross violation of human rights, including, you know, criminal activity. So, and this is supported by 400 social organizations plus mobilizations. The crucial question for me seems is, is this. Will the elite in the Congress and in the Senate be brave enough to actually, you know, vote? And it seems to me that that's where the problem lies, because if you were to compare the accusations against Dilma Rousseff in terms of the crimes she was supposed to have committed, with what Bolsonaro has done, with the irrefutable evidence, then, you know, Dilma Rousseff's pales into insignificance. So, therefore, it's a political question. When it came to Dilma, the majority of the Congress voted to impeach her. When it comes to him, it's different. I think the reason is, and I'll finish with this point, is the reason is that they are very worried about what comes after that if he goes. And that's, I think, where the hesitation lies within the elite politics, particularly in the political class in the Congress and the Senate. Well, that takes us nicely to the next point then, which I want to put to Carlos. When you evaluate the risk facing uh, Brazil right now, what is it? I mean, what would happen, to put it in the question of, of Carlos, if he is impeached, where does that leave the country? Well, let me say first that uh, in our case, base case scenario, we don't think uh, uh, there is a, right now, um, a significant likelihood of President Bolsonaro being impeached. Actually, uh, I agree totally that uh, he, his uh, support in the opinion policy is the data for your one gives 30, 31 percent approval rating, a 40 percent rejection rate. Is the worst thing he was elected. That's quite clear. Uh, the media and the opposition is asking for his impeachment. Uh, the situation in Manaus, Manaus is extremely bad for him, but we need to look closely at the way politics operate in Brazil. I think Dilma Rousseff was mentioned here. I think one of the one of the problems Dilma Rousseff had, she was very bad at handling political alliances finding the right coalition. I think she was very inflexible. And that's why, in the end, she was impeached. I think Bolsonaro has shown more dexterity to bring people together. In fact, I think for us, the critical the critical indicator would be the election of the head of the lower house, the speaker of the lower house, and the president of the Senate on the 1st of February. And the latest information we had is the candidates of Bolsonaro, Pacheco in, in the Senate, and Arthur Lira in, in the lower house are the favorite to, to win that election. So, so, if so hang Pacheco on, Carlos, you're saying that the, that the upcoming elections, rather than being a risk to him, will strengthen, will most likely strengthen his position in the Congress? Well, I'm talking about the election of the leadership of Congress. Absolutely. Which takes place on the 1st of February. The current Speaker of the House, Rodrigo Maya, the outgoing one, is a declared enemy of Bolsonaro. And Maya has a candidate he's supporting, is uh, Balea Rossi. And Balea Rossi is behind Arthur Lira, which is the candidate of Bolsonaro. And the latest uh, tally suggests that Lira is going to win that race. If Lira wins, then the risk of being him impeached would diminish significantly, and they say in the Senate. And the critical guy is going to be the Speaker of the House because is the, the person who has to accept or reject the request for an impeachment. Uh, as, as, um, as was mentioned before, 57 requests for his impeachment has been made, but Rodrigo Maya, the outgoing, never uh, table any of those requests. If Lira wins the lower house with the support of Bolsonaro, friends and parties, I see less possibility of this happening. Nonetheless, nonetheless, uh, the, the decline in popularity will actually undermine Bolsonaro's chances of being reelected in 2020, 2022. He's losing support on the former court base 
that were behind him in 2018. OK, let me take that scenario to Gabriella and say that seems to be the sort of analysis that you hear right now. But when you take into account the, the, the drop in popularity, I think the last uh, poll on Friday talked about an 8%, was it, or 7% decrease in popularity in a relatively short period of time. Can one count on the, the Senate, the, the House of Deputies, the Chamber of Deputies being, you know, uh, indifferent to the rising public uh, distrust of the president as time goes on, if those numbers continue to fall? Yeah, to think about impeachment in Brazil, I think we have to think about four different reasons. Uh, so there's the legal one, and it's obvious that uh, we have all the legal um, situation in order to have an impeachment. We have to think about the support from the citizens, and this one is decreasing. This is very important, and it's decreasing. That's why we had all of the protests. We have to think about the support from the elite, and this is decreasing, but not enough. So we still have a lot of businessmen supporting Bolsonaro, and they fund uh, the party, so it's important to think about that. And then the fourth uh, reason that can make uh, an impeachment move on is about the political support, as Francisco was explaining. Uh, but actually, the president of the Congress, the, the leader of the Congress, he has a very important role because he's the one who approves or not uh, the impeachment. So, of course, he will listen to all of these other reasons. He will listen to the society. He will listen to the elite. Uh, but he is the one who makes the decision. And, of course, there's a lot of discussion behind the scenes here. So, Gabriela, how far can he talking... go in ignoring polls? If I mean, there are some scenarios talking about that his popularity could reach into the 20s, at which point it would be very hard for the Congress to ignore that and to ignore the impeachment clause. <laughs> It depends who are the 20s, and it depends how the 80% of the others are strong enough to make an impeachment to happen. So, right. uh, what, as I was just saying, if, the, if inside the 20s we have the financial uh, power, then we will not go on with the impeachment. So, the Congress are not only listening to the society, they are also listening to the society. But there are a lot of other things going on here in this kind of, of discussion, you know? Interesting. Uh, Francisco, to what extent was the COVID outbreak in Manaus in particular a political turning point? Yeah, I, I think uh, the... I'll, I'll answer this question, but the issue of concentrating exclusively on parliamentary manoeuvres, which is important in terms of understanding what might happen, ignores completely the rest of the context. Ever since he's been in charge, Brazil has gone down quite dramatically on every single score and index. He's not respected internationally at all. Brazil was a very strong voice in the world. The economy was growing, was growing quite dramatically. Income distribution was getting better all the time, and so on and so forth. Now it's exactly the opposite, but with a vengeance. It's very, very, very bad. And his attitude regarding the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has been absolutely appalling. I mean, it's worse than Donald Trump by, you know, multiplied by 10. And as a result of that, he's very bad. And as a consequence, you know, people are dying visibly because of his lack of competence and complete disregard for the well-being of his own people. And that's why Manhaus became such an important focal political point. My issue is how can the you know, key sections of the elite in parliament ignore this when they have to request Venezuela to send them oxygen. And uh, Venezuela is sending them oxygen literally every, single, every seven days. He's already sent 136,000 uh, litres of oxygen, which has sorted out, as it were, temporarily at least the problem. And he continues to actually have this attitude. So if, as a result of parliamentary manoeuvres, uh, ignoring situations like Manaus and, you know, the rest of the society continues, then there are two options, which I think, because of the unrest that this is likely to provoke, 
and the level of disturbances in every possible sense, including the stock exchange and the economy as a whole, then the government of Bolsonaro is very heavily militarized. He's brought in, um, in some cases, some unsavory characters who haven't got democratic views. And in consequence, the military might be tempted to go for something more dramatic, not necessarily a coup d'etat, but certainly, you know, to actually gain even more prominence, which is not good for Brazil, is not good for anybody, or, or else then he... Is so, going well, to hang on, what kind of measures are you hinting at, Francisco, that you could see? Well, if, if the military acquire more prominence, and they've proved this to be the case already, which is they, they unleash repression. And repression doesn't help anybody. It doesn't right. help the people. And the people are in the streets, and this is going to continue. And if I may broaden this slightly for the time being, uh, before we continue the discussion, if you look at what's going on in the rest of the uh, continent, you know, repression doesn't work. It produces the opposite result. You right. can see the situation in Bolivia and Chile and so on. Right, right. And finally, in mm -hmm. terms of Trump being defeated, how can anybody, you know, legitimately continue with such a, gro a crass attitude to politics and society? All right, well, it's a good thing you mentioned that point. That segues nicely into my next question. I want to uh, bring it to Gabriela. How much of this protest and impeachment movement in Brazil has been actually inspired by what's happened to Donald Trump in the U.S., do you think, Gabriela? Uh, what's clear now, I think, that that's one of the reasons of the protests, is that all the... The, uh, actually, Bolsonaro was having a strategy of being supported by, by Trump and think that he was supported by Trump. So a part of his discourse and his attitudes were based on the idea that Trump was doing the same. And now that Trump lost the election, and most of all, the way he did it after the election uh, made it clear to Brazilians also that Trump was not a good solution, and most of all, that Brazil has not the support of USA anymore. And this will be a big problem for us in the future. And actually, so uh, do you think if we see the impeachment remember, process pick up in the US, that that might rub off onto Brazil as well? Yes. Yes, of course, of course, because it's clear now for Brazilians that we're supporting Trump and we're supporting Bolsonaro that there, there are a lot of mistakes in, this, in all of this process. I think that things are, are, are being clearer now, and this is uh, why also the impeachment can, can grow. I, again, I don't think that we have a clear situation of impeachment right now. Right. I think there's a lot of things to, to happen in the future. In play. But right. of, of course, the impeachment of Trump's uh, increases the chances of, uh, of the idea of, it happening of impeachment in here in Brazil. Let me go back yeah. briefly to Francisco before I go to Carlos and say, uh, can, can we make this assumption or analysis yet that the tide, when you look at what's happened to Donald Trump and you look what's happening to Bolsonaro with his popularity at least, is the tide turning against populism in the Americas? Yeah, that kind of populism. I mean, Trump became extremely popular <clears throat> with his... Well, some of the extremes used that look like, you know, somebody politically brave. Now they've been completely discredited because people, at least in the United States, and I'm sure elsewhere, can see where they lead to. They lead to very undemocratic practices, including the practice of violence. Imagine regime, regime change being brought to the United States by the U.S. president himself. This is unbelievable. So anybody who resembles Trump, now that Trump is facing impeachment and the possibility of a trial and conviction, you know, nobody's going to actually have any sympathy for somebody like Bolsonaro who hasn't modified one iota his views, which are continue to be crass. Okay. And when he faces this crisis, all he's trying to do is to concentrate on parliamentary maneuvers, which is not going to um, support him more, he's not going to strengthen him, he's going to weaken those who support him. All right, let me that ask... Here, not to call him for impeachment. All right, so I think basically we've been talking about, obviously, the health risk the political risk. Carlos, is there an economic risk here that's building as well? It might not be the most prominent thing in the headlines, which are kind of dominated by street protests, but when you look at some of the dry numbers, government spending is shot up by 40% between January and November of last year. Debt is at 91% of GDP. Are harder times right around the corner? Yeah, I think... Um... I said at the beginning that, uh, and, and I agree that right now, there is no condition for impeachment for the reason I explained before. No, not only to add 
uh, that because of the COVID lockdown, the, the possibility of having millions of people on the streets, as was the case with Dilma, is not there yet. But I think Bolsonaro is facing two major risks. One, if he get out of, if, if the if the second wave of COVID nineteen claim more and more lies, and he is totally out of his depth, and he cannot handle that. Um, the second thing is this income transfer that made him temporarily popular in 2020 came to an end on the 30th, 31st of December. And there is no money. Brazil is a broke country. The fiscal deficit of Brazil right now is 15% of GDP. The so what's next? Austerity now is more measures? Than... A rise in interest rates? Well, um, that's, that's the danger for, for, for Bolsonaro. He could actually go into populist measure and trying to implement uh, and bring back this um, relief package. But there is no money. He does the that, he vouchers. will lose the confidence. The so-called corona vouchers. If he does that, uh, there is no money to do it. But if he does that, he will lose the confidence of the financial markets straight away. Brazil will downgrade it. And, and the access of Brazil to capital market will be more complicated. So if the economy tanks and the coronavirus get out of control and he continue blocking the, the approval of the vaccine for the, by the Chinese or the Russian, etc., then I think the possibility of impeachment would increase. But you need to take into consideration these three factors. And, and there, is, there is also the question of timing. I think... A lot of people will start now positioning for the election in 2022, and many of the people that want him pitch in, 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 in the political party will say, OK, um, yeah, he has committed a lot of crimes here, but actually the best option for us is to start building a coalition to defeat him in 2022. So that possibility is also there. All right. I think we've got a couple of minutes left. Let me try and give it to Gabriela and ask this question. If the situation is deteriorating, economically, politically becoming more unstable, and health-wise we know the challenge there. Is this translating into more of an opportunity for the left? What, why isn't there the sort of consensus among the non-Bolsonaro forces or anti-Bolsonaro forces? Yeah, we are facing now a disruption between uh, two ideas that support the government, and we don't know how Bolsonaro will deal with it. So Bolsonaro is governing both with populist, uh, populist, popular actually policies. So the idea of cash transfer, for example, that uh, brought him many support from the poor people, and at the same time he had a lot of support by the liberal agenda. But right now, it's impossible to conciliate or keep conciliating both the popular and the liberal agenda. And both actors are trying to enforce him to make a decision. Will he make the, the kind of reforms that the liberal agenda wants him to do? Or will he keep doing cash transfer programs, even if we don't have enough money? So. This kind of decision uh, Bolsonaro will have to do right now, and this will make him lose support from one of the parts of the of the story. At the same time, uh, as Carlos just said, uh, the health um, dimension is getting worse and worse, and we have no perspectives of getting better because we don't have the vaccines. Uh, Bolsonaro government fought with China and with India and with everybody, uh, with Pfizer this week. So we don't have any perspective of getting enough vaccines. And of course, uh, this makes people die more. And at the same time, it, it makes the, the economy uh, don't increase enough because we don't have people vaccinated. So we have, uh, like, how can I say, a moment of a lot of crisis. And it depends on how the government will deal with all of them and which decisions he will make in order to know what, right. what kind of support he will be able to have right. about right. the populism or about the, the liberal agenda. So it's really a, a bad moment for Bolsonaro. Let's hope they make the right decisions for the sake of uh, Brazilians. Thanks so much to our guests, Carlos Caicedo, Gabriela Lota and Francisco Dominguez. And thank you too for watching. You can see the show again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, head over to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. 
from me, Sami Zaydan, and the whole team here. For now, it's goodbye.